Hello, Johan. It's great to have you on again. Thanks again, Marco. Here we go. So uh, this time, of course, um, it's about the editorial that you wrote um, on uh, on uh, Anglo America, the EU, the West, and you have a major collection of prognostic uh, points that you're sharing with the readers. And um, what I like very much is that you begin with uh, the Oxford students. Uh, challenging of, of Cecil Rhodes. And you know that that's an African criticizing him. Indeed. And Cecil Rhodes was street. He was not only a racist and an upper class person. He was a colonialist. In addition to all of that, he was a believer in Anglo-Saxon supremacy. That um, sort of was the crowning achievement of the whole human endeavor. He called it British to start with, but to get the Americans in, he switched to Anglo Saxon. And in 1891, this is of course very basic in the editorial, he founded with a couple of others, some five, six other persons, a secret society called Nothing Less Than Society of the Elect. Can you imagine? And then we have this um, Professor Carol Quigley from Georgetown University, who says that his point is not that he disagreed with them. He might have disagreed on some points, but by and large, he thought that they were moving the world in a good direction. His point as an historian was that they were doing it secretly. And as an historian, he felt that the, the history Historical research would shed its light on it. And this is where I have this quote from you from Peace by Peaceful Means, your book published in 1996, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the quote says, Science and idiosyncrasy do not go together, nor do science and secrecy, as in security studies, protected by the confidentiality stamp, science, you wrote, is public and must be open to public scrutiny. Well, that to me is the whole point about science. You know? The whole point about science is public. Science is public. I think that was a very great idea. Uh, what then constitutes science, whether it is uh, with a heavy weight on the empirical, or the heavy weight on the creative, or, what, or the heavy weight on the, the holistic and the uh, explosive forces inside? That we can discuss. But the point is, it's public. You put forward how you think, and you lay it all open to public scrutiny. And then others come in and say that is she a nonsense, you forget this and that, and so on. This is the whole point of it. Do, do you care to say, to elaborate a little more about um, this, um, your irritation with the secrecy? Um, as pointed out by Carol Quigley and as you um, report in your editorial? Well, you see, there are several points here. Mm -hmm. I think the basic point, from my point of view, is the whole idea of the Aryan race and how um, <coughs> Cecil Rhodes disagreed with Hitler only on one point. It was not the German race, but the Anglo-Saxon race that was the superior. And since the German one was competing, not the least on the point of who is the most superior race in the world, they had to be beaten. The secret society was partly secret because the use of war, which they did not abstain from, there was nothing pacifist. They saw the war as a part of their civilizing mission, very clearly. And the use of war was extremely crude. Now, Marco, again, to you as an African, Cecil Rhodes, of course, was the English, the English colonialist. And his whole idea was that the whole stretch from Cairo to Cape Town should be run by the British Empire. So there was an irritating spot, and that irritating spot was Transvaal or the Boers. They had to be eliminated. Exactly. 
And to do that, they invented nothing less than what people think was Hitler's innovation, the concentration camp. Hitler was just imitating it. And they did something that even Hitler's concentration camp didn't do. Of course, the rations of food in the concentration camp were, put it mildly speaking, not very good. As we know, they all were extremely meager and skeleton-like. But since these were concentration camps for the wives and the children or the fighters among the Boers, they put them on half rations, which means starvation. And the figures are staggering. 37,000 children starved to death, 20,000, and 37,000 as a total, the others being essentially the wives. Now, how cruel can you be? You can understand that they wanted this, in a sense, um, in the shade of a secret society. On the other hand, they had to operate. And for that reason, they had a circle around the society of the elect, called the Association of the Helpers. So that was a network. And the more peripheral ones didn't even know that they were in it. So one of them, a rather important one, was uh, Lord um, Alfred Balfour with the Balfour Declaration. Yeah, precisely. Precisely, 1917. Now, Cecil Rhodes himself died in 1902, and the major person carrying it on was Alfred Milner, who was responsible for the Boer War. He was the one constructing it with all its cruelty. Only mildly, only mi just just a, topically related. Of course, 1902 in my African mind is just two years before the uh, genocide against the Hereros by the Germans in Namibia, not too far away from South Africa. Not far away, precisely. You know, the that one was in um, 1904. Precisely. And that was a Prussian general. Uh, von, von Trotha. Exactly. And the point about it is that they were fighting with genocidal means. We attribute the genocide to the Prussian general against Harare, but what Cecil Rhodes did was nothing less genocidal than that. And the people he was up against, he was up against was basically the Sulus in the southern part of Africa and South Africa. So there were others too, and they were exposed to genocide. So the point is that the word Cecil Rhodes has retained a kind of sacred, almost untouchable quality. Uh, that is certainly not the case with Hitler. And if I may, uh, I mean, all of this, of course, you're bringing up so many associations in my mind. One of them, two of them, in fact, one being uh, what happened to the Herero in Namibia. And another one, which to this day I cannot fathom, is the um, Leopold statue in the middle of Brussels. In the middle of Brussels, the EU's capital, there is a King Leopold statue, uh, larger than life, as if he never killed those 10 to 15 million people in the Congo. Yeah, well, the figure I usually hear is 10 million, but um, that was Leopold I. And there is no memorial in honoring of the 10 million. In the whole city of Brussels, the whole country of Belgium, uh, the topic is considered by and large unmentionable. But then, as you immediately said, Marco, and I think that is so important, the Oxford students, like the Princeton students a short while ago, pointing out that Woodrow Wilson was a racist, and that one shouldn't have a Woodrow Wilson School of International Studies at Oxford. They managed to get the plaque removed, honoring Cecil Rhodes and the statue may follow. And I think the Cecil Rhodes scholarships will gradually 
simply wither away. All the gradually or all of a sudden. They are of course doing something to try to save it by redefining it, saying that they have now institutes of equality and African culture and things of that kind. They are updating, but still the name is tainted, like the name Woodrow Wilson. And it is high time that Western civilization rid themselves of it. The similarity to Hitler is very depressing. Indeed, very much. Woodrow Wilson was very important in launching the First World War. And his predecessor was President Taft. And Taft was, of course, the one who had the Taft-Katsura agreement with Japan about what they called peace in, East, peace in East Asia. Namely, I, the United States said, Taft said, take Philippines and you, Katsura, you take Korea. And that they called peace in East Asia. So when the secret society decided Taft has to go, because he was against the First World War, against Germany. And Woodrow Wilson has to be brought in. That says quite a lot about Woodrow Wilson. Too. A member, by the way, of the Ku Klux Klan, which is something that not many people know. It's incredible, you know. I mean, there is some saying that he didn't quite understand what it was. But <laughs> just nonsense. So here we have then two, if you will, so-called lights of Western civilization or Anglo-Saxon civilization. Woodrow Wilson, Cecil Rhodes, down they go, down they draw. Johan, in the editorial, you also um, bring up something that I find is very important um, for the understanding of macro history, which is Ibn Khaldun's um, stages. Could you perhaps specify the stages of Ibn Khaldun um, for our listeners and watchers and then elaborate how Ibn Khaldun allows you to make prognosis of how, where the West, as it likes to call itself, is right now in, at this moment in history? Well, you know, Ibn Khaldun was a Tunisian diplomat, among other things, and he was about all, if you will, the founder of modern sociology, and I would say macro-history. So macro-history being where you go into a society, small or big, but you have the long time span, and you try to go through different phases. And he more particularly identified four, and the society at his time was what today we would call a village. It was a small, closed thing, could be a little town. And he started with the founding fathers of it, who were burning of idealism. The light was shining for them. They had an ideal they believed in. How they got into that position comes in stage four. <laughs> now, stage two, you may call them the sons what was also the main sons. But when we say sons, we're thinking of one generation the following the other. Now, this first stage could last some generations. But then comes the next generation, and that is the ritualistic imitation of the first generation. The people do it more or less the same way, but they no longer really believe in it. They no longer really believe in it. And um, they can do it without believing in it. They can just simply follow the rules, so to speak. Third stage, that disappears. And what then disappears is what was cementing the first and second stage, the Asabia, the solidarity. You can say that for the first stage, the solidarity was based on sharing the common ideal. For the second stage, on sharing the common ritual. So at least something. The third stage, it's gone. 
it's gone and what comes in its place is individual egoism and the fourth stage is the fight of everybody against everybody and at that point something happens somebody is knocking on the door the gates somebody from the outside and to the mind of even Khaldun, those were the Bedouins, the nomads, fresh from the desert with their ideals. Gaddafi. <laughs> and they smelt and they sensed that this is a rotten kingdom of Idris the first, since you mentioned Gaddafi. They smelt that. Your time is up. They broke down the gates, in they came, and they are at the first stage again. So the renewal from the outside, and that was very basic in Khaldun, with the egoism, with the loss of Asabiya, and the loss even degenerating into the fight of everybody against everybody. They were unable to renew themselves. So I, of course, take this one. And I put it into the West. And I ask myself, what is happening? However, when I do that, I'm also leaning on something else, an other macro history, as you know from the other you, and that's the story of the Roman Empire. And I pay some attention to the fact that the Roman Empire had, when it was coming to an end, the Western part of it, exactly come to the stage number three and four of Ibn Khaldun. They were not participating, they were observing, they were enjoying themselves. And what they were observing were of course essentially gladiators killing gladiators to the honor of the king. And that happened at the Colosseum and similar places all around the Roman Empire. Killing, killing, killing like we are watching killing on television. I switch on television, it's killing all the time. It is just amazing how much killing. Even Christmas Eve, I found killing. I expect it to be on for New Year's Eve too. So, can such a society renew itself? Well, the West Roman Empire collapsed, but the East Romans survived. 1,000 more years, which is quite a long time. In other words, there was a difference between the West and East Roman Empire. And the West Roman came to even Khaldun 3 and 4, but the East Roman not. So what was the difference? Well, since the split was along a religious line, Catholic versus Orthodox, it is, I think, would be very wrong, not at least to explore religious roots. And the religious roots are different. In Catholicism, it is to a large extent the sadomasochism or Good Friday, which we call good, it was not good at all. It was an evil Friday with a father sacrificing his son for the very abstract ideal, actually two of them, salvation and eternal life. Now, these were no small gifts if you were able to bestow that in all humanity, but uh, the proof was missing. You can contrast that with the Orthodox, which does not focus on Good Friday, but on Easter Sunday. Christ is a risen. Wogs crazy in Russian. Christ is up. And they derive from that a long-term optimism. And then, um, well, they lasted 1,000 years. We were beaten by the Muslims, by what became the Ottoman Empire. In 1453, and Constantinople became Istanbul. So they had to move from Constantinople, they moved to Moscow. And Moscow became the third Rome, as they called it. The first Rome being Roma, the second Rome being Constantinople, which they had to give up. 
and the third Rome in Moscow. When I was a student, Michael, in 1953, a kind of student leader, as they call it, and my specialty was international student relations. So I was traveling around in many places in the colonies that we knew very soon would not be colonies. And I was asking them, what do you hope will happen, happen to your country when you are liberated, when you are free from colonialism? When did I do that? Well, I did it in 1951, 52. 1950 I started. In other words, the end of colonialism was, I to say, less than 10 years ago. And the answer was an almost unanimous answer. We want our country to be like the Soviet Union. In other words, the third Rome, which was the Orthodox Church. Again, Moscow was carrying a beacon. I would estimate that that beacon will reach at least one billion people around the world. And when the Soviet Union finally collapsed, and we are talking about something very recent, from 1989, with the end of the war, the Berlin Wall, into the early 90s. A very large part of humanity lost the shining light. It had stopped shining to a large extent. But you know what human beings do? They say, well, that's because of this and this and that and that. The basic idea is good. But the basic idea seems also to have collapsed. I say this now because it's incredible. You cannot help thinking that what kept the Soviet Union alive was as a continuation of orthodoxy. And, you know, Stalin believed in orthodoxy. He was himself trained at, a, at an orthodox seminar. He believed in it, believed in the ritual, believed in incense and mirror, in music, in all of it. And he did not believe in what Trotsky believed in, namely that the message was for the whole world, the revolution for the whole world. So Trotsky was excommunicated, to put it mildly. Now, a very, very I, interesting point to him. Well, I find something of the same in Putin, you see. The optimism, in spite of all the evil things that you can read about Russia and Putin in the Western media. Not that I would pay that much attention to it, but what keeps Putin afloat, I think, is also that long-term optimism. In other words, here we are in deep culture, and I pay attention to the fact that the rift, the split, was in 395, and then, then, as you know, in the editorial, I am putting it into the Western world and expecting a similar rift between West-West and East-West. You have to elaborate a little bit. Well, the East-West is your opinion. Sorry, you have to repeat that again? Sorry? No, we have now a Western Empire in decline, a very rapid decline, economically, politically, militarily. An interesting thing, the U.S., which is so proud of its military, doesn't even manage to win the simplest so-called small wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Somalia. They're just messing it up, one way or the other. Now, if you look at that, we are in a situation where if I then take the Roman Empire division, and I just simply playing with the thought, could there be a similar division in the Western Empire? Could there be a West-West and an East-West? And the West-West is, of course, the United States, and the East-West across the Atlantic would be the European Union. Paying some attention to the fact that some of the 28 members of today's European Union are actually very Catholic. Some are orthodox, we are thinking of Bulgaria particularly, we are trying to get more, uh, but um, I 
think Bulgaria has placed itself wrongly and probably playing its cards wrong. But we leave that aside. This is, I don't want to interrupt you because I really want to hear more about the, um, if you like, the anatomy of this rift that you see between um, the eastern part of what the western civilization calls itself as western and the western part. Uh, you've ha you have some details in the editorial about, um, let us say, the uh, Judeo-Christian heritage that the west is very proud of. Interestingly, the Hellenistic aspect of the Western heritage never gets mentioned in this dual uh, Judeo-Christian combination. And the secular nature of what the West qualifies as one of its um, characteristic traits. So you have this, this very um, sort of differentiated look at the USA and the EU and what distinctions sort of... Um, uh, separate them. If you could say a little more about that and why you see that as a potential conflict formation of long duration for the time to come. Well, what to me is basic in all of this is um, the word faith that the United States... Your, your volume has gone down a little, unfortunately. Could you maybe... Better. Pardon me? Is this better? Um, perhaps there's something on the microphone. On the microphone. Much better now. Much better? Much better now. Okay, fine. Right. Well, I have to watch that I don't change position. Well, Michael, I'm just thinking that um, the difference between Catholic and Orthodox. The Catholics are much more believers in something it's very hard to believe. Whereas the Orthodox, I mentioned salvation and eternal life. The Orthodox did not deny salvation and eternal life. But they focused their eyes on the fact that Christ was alive. He has arisen. Whereas on the Catholic side, it was the death. Of Christ on the cross. Now you find, of course, the cross as a symbol in both of them. And then, then asking myself, could it be something similar when you look at the US versus the European Union? And I first focus on the European Union. They have actually, to a large extent, left Christianity behind except for the eastern part of today's European Union. So I mentioned there will be problems in that connection. What has come in this place is secularism. You want please just a bit louder because this is so, I would consider this rare and precious, what you're saying, and I can barely hear. I'll try to see if I can. So you see, the point is this, that um, in the western part of the European Union, in the founding part, if you will, secularism has taken the place. Now, secularism has a nucleus which is very similar to Orthodox Christianity's optimism. It's not really long-term optimism, it's short-term, it's called idea of progress idea of progress. There is a promise of progress. Now, somebody linked that idea to economic growth, somebody else linked it to democracy, somebody else to human rights and so on, and maybe to a combination of all this. But the progress, the idea of progress made for optimism. So let us then turn to the other side. I think it is very important to understand the way United States was founded was by very true believers, the Puritans. And they came from East Anglia, while laden in the Netherlands, where they were refugees, persecuted by the Anglican Church. They were searching for freedom for their faith, and it was what we today would say, highly dogmatic Christianity. Very Puritan, indeed, 
as some matter of fact, we have taken that word from them. And not at all imbued with the idea of progress, the idea of faith. But the faith, the belief in the God, and that was a God, and they were of a strong opinion that they were the successors to the Jews who had broken the covenant, and they were holding a new covenant with God as successors to the Jews. Now that brings them up very close to God, very, very close. And the question is then, what does it mean? What do they see in God? Well, I think what they saw, among other many things, was not only that God had in his wisdom the chosen people, now them. And in order to emphasize they were successors to the Jews, the capital of Connecticut was called New Canaan, and they baptized their children with Jewish names. But in addition to that, I think it was very important for them that what God was doing with the help of Jesus Christ was to condemn the living and the dead. The part of the Christian faith. It's, you know, the Christian faith is divided into three articles. One devoted to the Father, one to the Son, and one to the Holy Spirit. Now, this part is in the it's one of the articles devoted to the son. So he was tortured on the Pontius Pilate down to the realm of death from which he returned and went to heaven to sit on the side of God condemning the living and dead. <coughs> now if you are chosen by them ultimately as a state you must also do the same, you must do the same, you must also condemn living and dead. And they certainly do. They are condemning all the time. And they are condemning the dead, and they are condemning those who are alive. And right now they are condemning some groups in Syria and not others. And they are condemning the Islamic State. <clears throat> now, imagine that the Christian faith might have been a little bit different. Jesus returned to sit next to his father to help humanity solve their problems and conflicts. And Christianity doesn't say that. Christianity says condemning living and dead. Now we have to remember that the Puritans were fundamentalists in the sense they took the right things very literally. So, here I see then the United States heading for something of which the European Union will slowly distance itself. I think it is already doing so, but I was wrong, I thought England, especially because I read too much into Tony Blair's apology, late, but better late than never indeed, for having participated so actively in the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the whole world. So having said, I and have a European, Union, a European Union and United States on two very different courses for the future. And there are similarities to the Orthodox versus the Catholic West Rome. The Orthodox East Rome, the Catholic West Rome. Well, and this is absolutely fascinating, especially because of what it may yield in terms of how to read geopolitics of the next 50 years. Um, but just before we continue on, Johan, how would it fit in that François Hollande and France called on the European Union um, to approach uh, the Middle East and to approach IS as a military union um, on the basis of the EU charter uh, to attack and um, root out uh, ISIS? You know, ISIS is originally the responsibility of two major powers in the European Union. We are talking about England and France, 
We're talking about Lord Sykes and Monsieur Picot, Sykes Picot. And the third party to the agreement was the Tsar, Nicholas I. But that was a little bit less certain. However, we take note of the fact that not only England has joined France in bombing, but also Russia. And they, Germany, Germany with infrastructure. Pardon me? And Germany with some infrastructure, with some ability, ability, facilitating ability. As they say in solidarity to the fellow members of the European Union. They put it very explicitly as solidarity, more than that they really believed in it. I think you have to be fairly stupid to believe in it, and that stupidity is supplied by U.S. intelligence. But the U.S., of course, wants, um, if you will, um, England and France to do the job, and uh, Obama wants U.S. to stay out. There is something that is more the usual talk about training, and there is some up and down. But I think the basic mistake they make, which I have said many times, is that they haven't understood that the Islamic State is about much more than something in Iraq and Syria. In Iraq and Syria, we see the immense brutality. We also see that some other places. And much of it can be related to the killing, killing, killing by the West in both Iraq and Syria. In Iraq and Syria, we see the liberation from Sykes-Picot, from the Islamic State. And of course, we see precisely the countries of Sykes and Picot trying to reconquer their former colonies. Iraq for England, Syria for France, but as they were together in 1916, they were also together today. In other words, you can say that here, the European Union, in this particular struggle, are the key responsible and carry much of the historical causal burden. What the um, United States pays attention to is that many of the people killed are Americans, because the Americans are held responsible not for sykes picot but for the recent killing in Iraq, and increasingly, directly, indirectly, in Syria. So if you look at it, the European Union is still carrying that ball. I don't know for how long. I don't think for very long. I think they will see that the Islamic State is very similar to what the European Union is about. It was an effort to bring all Christian countries together, starting with some visions in the 13th century. Pierre Dubois was his name, particularly. And um, uh, very similar. And that they have the same right to talk about the Caliphate as an organization for the believers, as the Vatican has to do for the believers in Catholicism. As you um, said in one of our I'll be against it. Please repeat that again, Johan. It's hard to argue against them because um, if you do that, you are arguing against yourself at the same time because you're doing exactly that. Or well, you have been doing it for a long time. Now, you can, of course, fight them. You can, of course, do that. You can bomb and bomb and bomb and bomb and you can have ground troops. But in that case, you should be aware of the fact that the Islamic State is not limited to Iraq and Syria. And it looks like the West has only picked up the Iraq-Syria aspect of it. Although they are now starting talking a little bit more. They are discovering a little bit more. The 16 countries that you listed in your previous editorial. But um, here's, uh, in, a, in a way, well... Um, yeah, I mean, you've, you've really, really pointed out all these things. Um, I would like to move on a little bit uh, to, our, um, to your prognosis. If you could um, say a little bit more about the prognosis that you make. And um, what I like very much is that you've brought up um, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, permanent interests. 
um, this terrible light motif that is at the basis of geopolitics. If you could say a bit more about those things, please. Well, I am in the prognosis, and whenever I say prognosis, and I'm happy you reminded me of being careful with the word prediction, because prognosis is something you can do something about. So the prognosis on, is on the condition that uh, nothing basic is done. That is usually a negative prognosis. The positive prognosis is what would happen if some therapy is attempted. I'm not saying that the United States cannot change. I'm not saying that, but you take something. And that something is sometimes called enlightenment. The optimists say, and Noam Chomsky seems to be among them, that the United States needs a second enlightenment. I'm not that optimistic. I think it needs an enlightenment, the first one. And the reason why I say that is, of course, that the Puritan faith in the chosen people with the promised land, successors to the Jews that failed the covenant, is so strong. And added to that, as you would immediately say, they have a second god called the market. So one should say they have been very imaginative in U.S. Christianity. They're combining God and mammon, 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 the money, courage, mammon. And to do that is supposed to be impossible. But they believe as much in the market as in the God. Now, if you believe in one which is unverifiable and the other one being very shaky, you're in for problems and very many people will then be egoistic and just take care of themselves. And they have one simple root of inequality. And the system permits them to, if you will, rake out of the whole thing fruits for the top that they can enjoy and get the safety, the security they want. You see, I think many of them see exactly the same problems as I am seeing, but they take care of themselves. You had amazing inequality in the West Roman Empire too. The East Roman had a little bit more concern for those later on, as far as I read from history. I see. I see. And, and um, in my next editorial, I have a little list, something like 12 pious wishes for the new year. They are very simple. And uh, I think it very much has to do not so much with immediately doing something on the side of the US, but starting thinking about something in a slightly different way. Johan, are you becoming are you becoming somewhat more um, uh, hum humble with your wishes? Uh, just four or five years ago, you had uh, four dozen wishes for New Year. <laughs> yes, in a sense, yeah. in a sense. But you see, in a sense, there's also something else going on inside my mind. I've been more and more convinced that basic to the whole thing is how you think about the world. So imagine that you think about the world, as I said, that you have a major task, namely condemning living and dead. Meaning, of course, the sinners among them. You're also sitting there with the key to salvation and eternal life. And the US has two keys, democracy and the free market. And, and one thing you pointed out a couple of years ago at a lecture was that um, immortality um, can be purchased by purchasing or funding a research branch or something like that. So you're in a such and such building for eternity. I don't yeah. believe <laughs> I think that's very important. At least as long as the name that you have managed to get on the building lasts. The question of the solidity of the building and the inscription. But for a reasonable period. So there we are. And um, in the next editorial, as I mentioned, 
I think of something that, to my mind, could serve as a therapy for this prognosis. But it is more than the way one thinks about it, the pious wishes. Johan, you also mentioned something that is important to me in that editorial, in this uh, current editorial. You say that the relations to Africa can be more equal and that the EU must learn how to do that. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit uh, for, as a closing point? You look for a deal, an agreement. So let us say that it is signed by the leadership of the European Union and the leadership of the African Unity. Well, that's not good enough. You have to investigate the effects of that agreement down, down, down in the two pyramids and what the effects are. And the effects could be unemployment in one and it could be more jobs in the other. Just to take one example. So when I say on the basis of equity, the equity is not for the leaders to decide. It's not enough that they raise their glasses to a toast, having signed what they think is a good agreement, because it favors both of them, not necessarily as persons, but as parties. Hello? The question is what happens lower down. So this is what the African Union and the African Union and European Union uh, simply have to learn. And I think the Africans have quite a lot to learn too in that regard. I think we have a lot to learn about independent thinking and self-reliance still, um, in a sense having to go back to the future, to a time when we in Africa, the politicized groups at least, we're aiming for more self-reliance, which is a time that is far, far gone and needs to return. But that's for another episode, I believe. That's it. I think so far we have had a long look into the future. And let us be, this was the last editorial for this year, 2015. And uh, I can only say the next one will be, if you will, from some point of view, more optimistic. More optimistic. Thank you very, very much for this very long interview, Johan, with which we close the year. Um, do you want to say anything about your next year's wishes already or um, next one? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Johan. Thanks indeed. Bye bye. Thanks for 2015. We are the border meet again. Crossing the border between two years. Thank you. Thank you.